Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, <laughs> well, that's a good crowd. I like that. <laughs> Welcome again to uh, Marquette University Law School. I'm Mike Boucher. This is On the Issues. This is our continuing series of conversations with news and policymakers, people who are doing interesting, important work in this region and beyond. And today we are uh, just delighted to have with us the new director of the Lubar Center for Public Policy Research and Civic Education. Won't you please welcome Judge Derek Mosley. I guess you could say this is a, something of a symbolic passing of the torch. Uh, if, if you, uh, maybe that's one way of putting it. But uh, for about the last 15 or 16 years, uh, I've been hosting these uh, discussions here at the law school, these On the Issues events. Uh, moving forward, Judge Mosley will be the guy hosting the discussions. And, uh, and let me just say on a personal note uh, how delighted I am uh, that Derek has uh, returned to the law school in a full-time capacity and, uh, and how excited I am about the good work that I know he's going to do in leading the public policy efforts for the Lubar Center. So again, welcome back. Mike, I appreciate that. Thank yeah. you. So I thought what we would do today is we will spend some time talking about uh, Judge Mosley's vision for the Lubar Center. We'll dig into some of the issues that I know you'd like to focus on in the, in the months ahead. Uh, we'll talk about why the judge stepped away from the bench, a question you said you get often. A lot. A lot. <laughs> um, but I wanted to begin uh, by uh, talking about the journey. Uh, the journey for Judge Mosley. And, and let's start with the Marquette connection. Yeah. Uh, what did this law school mean to you as a oh, young man, man from the city of Chicago? You came right out, right? Yeah. So, okay. okay. Um, well, th actually, this law school meant a, a lot to me. When I look back at my uh, time here at Marquette, so let's start with the very beginning. I mean, a fantastic education, right? Met my wife here. That's not a bad thing. Right, yeah. right. Uh, met my, uh, the best man at my wedding, my best friend here. Um, Marquette has been pretty much everything for me. It introduced me to the city of Milwaukee. I say this story all the time. So when I, when I came here to Marquette, I, I actually came sight unseen. And so when I came, I didn't know anything about what was going on. And, I, and this story is really funny because all, all my friends that I hung out with at the law school, it was time for me to go get a haircut. And so uh, all my friends that hung out at the law school were, were white. And so I was like, well, I need to go get a haircut. And they're like, oh, you got to go to the barber right on campus. So I'm like, okay. So I show up to the barber on campus. And as soon as I walked in, he's like, oh, oh, oh no. no, no. I don't know how to cut your hair. So, uh, so it was, if it wasn't for um, a professor at the time by the name of Phoebe Williams, Phoebe would take uh, the students of color, the black students, and show us, hey, let me show you black Milwaukee show you what's here other than what you see here on campus. And it was those experiences that made me fall in love with the city. That's great. You, uh, you talked about being a public defender. Yeah, yeah. Why did you want to be a public defender? Yeah, you know, I, I, I just was all about defendants' rights, all about trying to do, uh, make sure that the, the system actually proved their case beyond a reasonable doubt. And I, I wanted to be a public defender. And I was actually, I, uh, Kim Heller Murata mm -hmm. was uh, the public defender that I worked with while I was here at Marquette. So we would do cases together. And what's so great about Marquette, when you're third year, you could try cases. So I was able to try cases with her. And so, um, yeah, I wanted to be a public defender. Unfortunately, the only public defender job was in uh, Hudson. And I- That didn't call I, That didn't call me, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> I hear it's a nice town. It's, so. it's gorgeous, don't get me wrong. I know the judge from Hudson, she's great. Okay. Um, but Hudson just wasn't calling me. No. So, so instead, you ended up in the DA's office. Yeah, it was, I never thought that was gonna happen. I thought I was gonna be a public defender. And then, I'll, I'll never forget, it's Thanksgiving, I'm at home, I'm back in Chicago, the phone rings. Uh, a regular phone <laughs> rings, and I, I pick up the phone, and it's uh, E. Michael McCann. Okay. And uh, he calls and says, hey, we've, we've had you in court. We've seen you try cases on the other side, and we just wanted to know if you'd be interested in be becoming an assistant district attorney. And I was like, you know, Mike, I never really didn't think about it. never thought about it. And he said something I'll never forget. He said, um, one of the good things about being a prosecutor is that you get to do the things that you think are right. Right. Um, instead of having to ask somebody to do what you think is right, you can actually do it. And that actually sold me. And so 
after Thanksgiving, I met with him, had an interview, and, and then that was it. I became assistant district attorney. So I'm intrigued by that. What did you think was right? What did you set out to do or to change? Yeah, just to make sure that when people came into the court system, they were treated fairly, that when they came into the court system, they felt like they, they were going to be heard. And so I wanted to make sure I was able to do that. And I thought as a public defender, that would be the easiest way for me to do that. But I was convinced by Mike McCann that you know, when you're the prosecutor, you can make sure that happens on every single case. You, know, you don't need anybody else to do that for you. You can do that. Uh, community prosecution was yes. something that you did. Explain to, to the people in this room, some of whom are familiar with that, yeah. but, but some of whom are not. Yeah, so I started a unit in the, the Milwaukee DA's office called the Community Prosecution Unit. And basically what it was is when you're a prosecutor, I feel like I'm like in a jury. I'm talking, I'm sorry, should I be looking at you? <laughs> no, I, no, no, I'm you're so good. used to talking to juries. You're so, good. So anyway, um, so... <laughs> So when, uh, um, so when you're a prosecutor, generally what happens is a police officer comes to you, hands you a police report, and says, uh, this is what happened, and then you charge out the case. In the community prosecution unit, we put prosecutors, myself and Shannon uh, Carrick, Wittenberger, put us out into the community. We were stationed uh, in the Harambe and Williamsburg Heights neighborhoods, uh, District 5 police station, as well as various uh, community-based organizations. And by doing that, we got an idea of what the neighborhood was all about. So when I was a prosecutor, a, a cop would come in and say, this happened on the 2400 block of North Palmer. And I'm not from here originally, mm -hmm. so the 2400 block of North Palmer meant nothing to me. But then when I did the community prosecution unit, and I was in the community, the 2400 block of North Palmer became, that's where Mrs. Jones lives. You know, that's where Mr. Smith lives. And so it, it made me vested in what was happening because it wasn't just a name, it wasn't just an address, it was a place that I was familiar with and that I was a part of. You know, one thing that I think that, that, that people who work in the criminal justice system, especially who work as prosecutors, uh, or judges for that matter, and we'll talk about that in a moment, uh, you, you have to fight the urge, I think, sometimes to become hard. That it can be a, an experience that hardens you. Yeah. Did you find that during your time as an assistant <sighs> DA? No, I, it, it wasn't so much that I felt like it was, it was you want the truth? Yeah. The honest got truth? And, and it's actually, yeah, I should probably give you the truth, right? <laughs> and so, um, but, but what it is, and is what's going on right now here in the state of Wisconsin, um, when you graduate and you have debt and you marry somebody with even more debt, um, you have to pay off your debt. And unfortunately, the way the system's set up here in the state, prosecutors and public defenders, uh, don't make a lot of money. They make money, but they don't make a lot of money when you take into consideration what you owe in student loans to come back. And so, truthfully, I, I absolutely adored the job. I loved the job, especially when I got out into the community. But it became a, a reality that financially I couldn't keep doing it and paying down my student loan debt and being able to buy a house and raise kids and things of that nature. So that's what really moved gotcha. me. So, so you have the opportunity to become a municipal judge. How, how old were you again? 31. That? The youngest, uh, uh, youngest ever in the state. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, and that was, I'm not saying to do that. I'm not telling people to do that. Um, at, you, you know, it, it was just happened to be at the right place at the right time. So um, a judge who I had uh, kind of shadowed, uh, I was part of a program when I was here at Marquette. Let me just say that. I was part of a program. Uh, it was by, uh, started by, I see you're in the back, Judge Dugan. Hannah, could you raise your hand? Judge Dugan was my uh, professor here at Marquette for a class called the Municipal Ordinance Defense Clinic, or the Mod Squad, we called ourselves. And um, when you're a third year law student, you're able to try cases under the student practice rule. And so uh, Judge Dugan uh, would allow us to try cases in municipal court. And so I was in municipal court. I tried my first case in municipal court while I was still a third year. But I struck up a relationship with the judge there, who happened to be Judge Lewis Butler. Sure. And uh, Judge Butler and I would have lunch, and then we used to have these little meetings. Um, it would vary from different judges' chambers. So it would be Judge Ashley, uh, Judge Donald, uh, Judge Butler, and we'd do these brown bag lunches where we'd get together and just talk about the state of uh, attorneys and mm -hmm. especially attorneys of color here in Milwaukee. And uh, that's what got me to, uh, to be familiar with the bench because Lewis was going to the circuit court. And he gave me a call and said, hey, I'm going to the circuit court. There's going to be an opening in municipal court. Why don't you try it? So I tried it, and, and I said, I got it? It was, <laughs> it was, it was surprising, but it was, it's where I 
was where I needed to be at that moment, for what, sure. What did you enjoy most about that, that new job? Oh, man, we did so many great things. Um, I see Sheldon Himley's in the back. She's the chief court administrator. Sheldon, can you raise your chief court administrator of the Milwaukee Municipal Court? Um, there's so many things I'm so proud about, about that job. Mm -hmm. um, first and foremost, um, we became more than just a court system. Um, so we did this, this, this program. We were having problems. We had over, I don't know, 50,000 warrants that were outstanding in the municipal court. And so one of my colleagues, Judge Hill, had come up with this idea that what if we just engage people to come back to the court system? So what, why don't we throw these things called Warrant Withdrawal Wednesdays? And then when we have these Warrant Withdrawal Wednesdays, then people on these 50,000 warrants will come into the court and then we'll re-engage with them because they're in the court. And so we said, well, once we have them here, let's just wrap services around them. So they come into the courtroom. Let's see if they have a driver's license. If they don't have a driver's license, let's try to do those, all, the, all that while they're here with us. Let's do the driver's licenses. Uh, we're going to lift the warrants, do the driver's license. And then we, we worked with Employee Milwaukee, um, an employment agency here in the city of Milwaukee. And they showed up to the court. So someone would come. So, so the first day of this warrant withdrawal Wednesday, I show up to court, and the line is from the municipal court <laughs> all the way down State Street mm -hmm. to the courthouse. And um, when people came in, they came in, they got their warrants lifted, they re-engaged with the court so we knew where they were because we didn't know where they were. Um, they met with someone from Employee Milwaukee who were actually hiring on the spot um, so that you had your driver's license, you got your warrants lifted, got your driver's license and got a job all while going to court, right? And so something that typically you don't think of court's doing, but it, it, we just had this base of people to work with. So I was really proud of that. I also started um, a homeless branch. Uh, court is a specialty court, if you will. Uh, a lot of the defendants that came through Milwaukee Municipal Court were in our court because they were homeless, and the offenses they committed were offenses because they were homeless. They might have been begging for money or sleeping somewhere they shouldn't be sleeping, things of that nature. So um, that demographic didn't show up for court because they had a very transient nature. So we decided to bring court to the shelters. So we held court sessions um, at the guest house. And so individuals were coming to the guest house for services, homeless services, alcohol and drug treatment, things of that nature. We were holding court there as well. So we can take care of their cases, uh, get them into housing. Because if you're homeless and they have, what's really good about housing first in Milwaukee County is they're able to place people. Yeah, give them a, a round of applause. <laughs> housing first is able to place people, but you can't be placed if you have a warrant. And so we had this homeless population that would come and get placed for housing, but couldn't be placed because they had the warrants. And it was difficult to get back into court. So if we came to them and hold court there, lift the warrants, get them into housing, get people back on track. To me, municipal court is, is one of those places where it, it is such an education because it is a reminder of how easily and how quickly people's lives can unravel. One thing leads to another. Absolutely. Something else happens and their lives are changed. They can't be here, they can't go there. I mean, Absolutely. it's really, I think the experience of that is really a very powerful experience for anybody in that profession. I did yeah, you know? there's, a, there's a number of things about municipal court that are, are interesting. It's a really high volume court. So when I first started at Milwaukee Municipal Court, we were doing about 140 to 160,000 cases a year. And there were only three of us. There's only three judges handling those type, all those cases. And so um, everybody, we look at it as the people's court, right? The vast majority of people who have any contact with the justice system have that contact in municipal mm -hmm. court. Is minor as a parking ticket? Who hasn't gotten a parking ticket? <laughs> all right, everybody take note, those, so Sheldon, <laughs> those who haven't raised their hand. Let, let, <laughs> but, but you know, everybody's you know, has gotten parking tickets and speeding tickets, and then you have the disorderly conducts and things like that. They start to build, but all that starts to compound. And when you don't show up for court, it really compounds. So you were the chief municipal judge, um, a, a role that you loved and a role that you were proud of. You said whenever you were photographed, you always wanted to be photographed in the robe. Absolutely. Why? Absolutely. Um, whether I went to schools to talk, whether I ever was given speeches, I always wore the robe. And I wore the robe because um, I wanted to normalize black men in black robes, right? Because we've normalized black men in orange jumpsuits. So I wanted to make sure. Absolutely. 
So it's a job you love. Loved it. Absolutely loved it. And so people come up to you and say, Judge, huh. wh why did you leave? Yeah. Well, I'm going to tell you why. You have something <laughs> to do with that. Let me tell you why. A, 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 number, of, a number of ways. Okay. So um, when, when Mike got hired here uh, initially 15 years ago, mm -hmm. I turned to my roommate who I had met here, Jonathan Smith, and I said, what, when, right when you got hired, I said, Boy, that'd be a great job. <laughs> I, I, I told him that exactly. We talk about it all the time. And then fast forward 15 years later, and then, and then here we are. And so it was always on my radar. And then right. um, talking to you, you actually pushed me along. Because it was hard to leave, right? I, was, I had been in a position for 20 years. I knew the ins and outs of the system. I felt pretty good about the system. And then talking to you made me realize that what I was doing at the municipal court was great, but I, had, I could have a bigger reach. So I, I, I always liken it to, like, to this. So when you're at municipal court, you deal with individual people and you try to help those individual people, right? So I'm essentially sitting on the, uh, on the banks of a river and I'm pulling people out of the river, mm -hmm. right? And what changed is coming here, now I can like go upstream and see why are people falling in the river, right? And so it made the difference. So when I was talking to you, that made the difference for me to take this position. Well, I'm glad if it played some small role because we're, we're delighted to have you here. Um, you know, I, I, I wanted to spend some time talking about your vision uh, for the Lubar Center. It's something that clearly uh, intrigued you 15, yes. 16 years ago right. uh, and has again uh, and has brought you here. Um, wh what role do you see the Lubar Center playing in this community? Yeah, I, I believe that we are a town hall. Right? We're a place where, and as I look out into this audience, this is exactly what I want for the Lubar Center. Right? Mm -hmm. We've brought together a number of people here from different age groups, ethnicities, economic backgrounds, jobs, all here talking about issues that affect us. Um, I remember when I sat down and met with Shell Lubar, mm -hmm. um, Shell said that he was pretty upset about the state of affairs here in the country in the sense that you can't get two people in a room together and talk without someone yelling at each other, screaming at each other, things of that nature. And so he wanted the Lubar Center to be a place where people could come, they can talk, and they can do it informed and can do it civilly. Civil discourse, right? It's okay to disagree, but just don't be disagreeable, right? And so this is what I want the Lubar Center to be. I want to bring in a vast number of people because if you don't do that, mm -hmm. what happens is all the issues that we all face, mm -hmm. if we're not even talking to each other, we're never going to solve those issues. So I want the Lubar Center to be a place where we can come together no matter where you come from to solve these issues that affect us all. Let's talk about some of those issues because already, I think, coming up uh, in just a matter of days, this room will play host to an event that yeah. deals with the, the reckless driving issue, something that I'm sure you saw uh, in, in your court yeah. uh, on a regular basis. Tell us a little bit more about that event and, and what you hope to accomplish with events like that. Yeah, so we partnered with um, TMJ4 News and we par partnered with um, the Sherman Park Neighborhood Association and we got together to throw a series of town halls and the town halls are gonna take place in every part of the city, downtown, north side, east side, west side. And we wanted to bring residents from all over the city to come together and tell the electeds and those in power what they would like to see done with the reckless driving issue. So downtown was up first, so I proposed why don't we have it here at the Lubar Center. And so uh, on the 13th of March, we will be here. Please uh, get on our website, register for the event. Um, you're all welcome. Um, and we're going to have the uh, Department of Transporta Transportation Secretary here. Um, we're going to have the mayor here, the county exec here, representatives of law enforcement, so uh, Chief Norman, who's also a, a graduate of this yep. law school, as well as uh, Sheriff Ball and um, uh, Chief Edith Hudson, who's mm -hmm. uh, the Marquette okay. University Police mm -hmm. Department. And we're just going to hear from the community on what they think needs to be done and tell their stories. Sometimes um, you think you know what's important, and I was guilty of that myself, and it's not until you talk to the people who live it every day. That what, what is your sense? I'm just curious. Yeah. Based on your set of experiences, what is your sense of what's going on with the reckless driving phenomenon? I, I, I would honestly say that uh, homicides remain a problem in this community. There's no question about that. But most people I talk to, reckless driving is the first thing they mention in terms of the quality of life. Yeah. 
What, what is your sense of what might be happening? Oh, it's a, it's a huge... So you want me to do the town hall now? Is what you're telling? <laughs> Just give us a no, preview no. of yeah, the town yeah, yeah. hall. Yeah, yeah, so I'll give you a preview of the town hall. <laughs> so, so basically, uh, I think there's, there's many facets to it. Uh, the first one that we have to say that we can't hide from is the fact that um, a decision was made uh, uh, several decades ago to take driver's education out of the school system. So that was number one, right? So I don't know if everybody here, but I learned at high school. That's where I learned, and it was free, right? right? Uh, and so when we pulled driver's education out of the high schools, then that left the only option being privately funded um, driver's ed programs. And I just had a daughter who just went through that program, and it's $500. And $500 makes it cost prohibitive for a number of people, a number of students at MPS to take part in that program. So that's number one. Uh, number two is actually the state law, which I don't think the state law is the problem, but the state law says that once you, uh, if you don't take driver's education, uh, you can wait till you turn 18, and then once you turn 18, you can just take the written test and you can get your driver's license. But what they missed on that part is there's no over-the-road driving. It's just take the test and you get your driver's license. So now you have a group that's never taken driver's ed, and you have a group that's never done over-the-road training, and now we've released them willy-nilly. And then we've taken it a, a step further. During COVID, and I understand why we did it during COVID, but during COVID, they said, well, because of COVID, we're going to let parents waive the driving tests for their youth so they don't have to take the test because no one wanted to be in the same vehicle because of COVID. And I get it. I understand why they did it at that time. But so now, and my daughter's probably the only one in her class that actually took the test, and she was mad at me for letting her, making her do that. But... But I just wanted to make sure another set of eyes saw her drive other than myself, right? And so that's part, that's part of the problem right there. And then this is generational. Remember, we did this almost two decades ago. And so now you have generations of drivers who don't know how to drive. And then it gets compounded by the fact that people like you and I, who generally are good drivers, we see what's going on, right? And you might be late for something, and the light turns yellow, and you run through the yellow. Right? Because you're like, I'm late and I see everybody else do it. And so now we're starting to capture people who generally wouldn't have driven poorly. Um, they're now doing it because they see that everybody else is getting away with it. So it's starting to, to snowball and get bigger and bigger and bigger. And so we have to figure out a way to, one, bring driver's ed back into the schools, and then two, get, uh, get these kids back doing over the road driving. Um, you, you mentioned to me the other day that there, you want to do something here. Um, that looks at, um, it really acts as sort of an introduction to people yeah. we should know. Describe for us what you're thinking. Right, so we're gonna throw these events called Get to Knows. Um, there's a number of people on a daily basis that are doing things that affect every single one of us that none of us know at all. And so the goal of the Get to Knows are to bring these individuals in. It's more of a, a less formal uh, event, so it might not even be in a room as big as the Lubar Center. It might be a, a smaller venue here on, at the law school. But I just want you to get to know who they are. So we have uh, teed up um, Dale Kuyinga, who's mm -hmm. going to be the new uh, president of the MMAC, right. MMAC mm -hmm. when Tim Sheehy leaves. So we have him uh, teed up. We have Jackie Carter uh, on our list of people to grab in. She's the new um, port director, city of Milwaukee port director, the first African-American female to hold that position. Um, I'm working on Shaka Smart because uh, he, he's busy right now. <laughs> he's a little busy you know? right now, but I'm working on Shaka Smart to come here as well, as well as Sarah Rodriguez, the uh, lieutenant governor. But there's a lot of people that on a daily basis affect what we do every day that many of us don't know. And I want to bring them into the Lubar Center, have all of you come here, and then have an, an opportunity where you can ask questions of them and say, how'd you get here? What do you, what's your plan for the port? Um, I learned something researching this is that the Port of Milwaukee brings in more tonnage than the city of Milwaukee. I mean, that's just unbelievable. That fact is just unbelievable. And, and Jackie's going to be in charge of it all. So it'd be nice for everybody just to get to know who she was and who she is and what's her, her vision for the port. So those are our get-to-knows, which are a little bit different from these OTIs. We have an issue or we're talking about a specific issue. This is just an informal, I, I say it's more of a late-night talk show gotcha. than, uh, you know, meet the press, right? <laughs> okay. it's, a little, it's a little bit different. <laughs> Yeah, speaking of issues, other things that you'd like to see uh, the Lubar Center focus on that, that, wanted, that you think deserve attention in the very near future? One of the things I'm really pleased about and I'm trying to, to, to 
help with is a study came out that said um, that we as a group of people are actually more divided than we've ever been. And when I say we're more divided than we ever, we're ever been is that we don't live in the same neighborhoods, our kids don't go to the same schools, we have very little interaction with each other. And so one of the things I'm bringing to the Lubar Center, we just had one on Sunday, and I see a couple faces of people who were here on Sunday, um, are these things that we call heritage dinners. And, and what we do at the heritage dinner, so this past February is Black History Month, so we threw a heritage dinner. We held it at what was called Turning Tables. Everybody's probably familiar with it as Turner Hall. But the first floor of Turning Tables is owned by an African-American female by the name of Emerald Mills. And she opened up that restaurant for us. And so I had four African-American chefs come and prepare meals that were brought to the American culinary palate by way of enslaved Africans. So if you eat fried chicken, why do you eat fried chicken? Well, I'll tell you why fried chicken you eat. Or mac and cheese, why do we eat mac and cheese? And collard greens, and uh, I'm getting hungry again. And, <laughs> and, uh, and candied yams and sweet potato pie. And so we had a narrative history. So we had each course that we were gonna eat in a narrative history by myself and uh, Tariq Moody from Hyphen Radio mm -hmm. about why we eat these things. And so we hope to do that for each Heritage Month. Our next one is scheduled for May. We don't have a, a date yet, but it's Asian Heritage Month, so we plan to have uh, all those different types of foods from Japanese, Chinese, uh, Hmong, Lao, uh, Thai here, chefs, and then get an introduction. But the thing about those events is they attract people who are familiar with that culture, and then they attract all of us here as well who come to these events. So it's kind of a mixture of people. You sit down, you eat, you listen, you learn from other people, and we hope you meet some new friends. You know, I remember from years ago, I interviewed a guy by the name of Marty Stein, and he was a, yeah. a really wonderful philanthropist in this community and died way too young from uh, cancer, I believe. And I remember interviewing him, and he said to me, you know, he said, when is the last time you invited someone who doesn't look like you or sound like you or is even from the same country you are, when's the last time you invited somebody like that into your house? Right. Not, to, not to do some, you know, uh, fix the plumbing or whatever. Right. But, but yep. he said, you have to, he said, to break down berries, you have to break bread. And that's, that's, that's the heritage dinner. And you know, and I knew Marty, and I'm wondering if that's why I came up with that idea. But, I, no, but, I, I, but, 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 but that is actually what we're trying to do with these heritage dinners, right? Is to get people to sit in a room. And those who, who were there, they, they took part with that on Sunday. You sat down in this room, we're all gonna eat, we're meeting people, we're talking, but we're all together doing something together. And so that's how you start conversations, that's how you solve problems, is if we can talk to each other like, civil human beings. And so please look out for those heritage dinners. It's a good way to meet new people and, and eat some delicious food. <laughs> Is that your biggest concern, the fact that we, we seem to have separated into camps and we can't talk to each other? Is that, uh, you know, I would assume that a lot of the programming that you're describing uh, attempts to address that, that, that chasm that seems to be growing, whether it's culturally or whether it's on a variety of different, in a variety of different ways. Is that really what we're, we're talking about? We've got to find a way to bridge uh, that, that huge gap? Absolutely. Um, because we aren't having these conversations and because we aren't talking to each other, there are all these issues that are going on in the city that affect every single one of us in this room today. But if we're not talking about it, I mean, just simple things, you know, whether we're talking about education or we're talking about housing or we're talking about poverty, if we're talking about just these, these concepts and we can't even get in the room to talk to each other. I saw something in the, in the news uh, just this year. They said that, uh, you know, uh, the governor just sat down with the leadership of the Republicans here in and Matt, it's for the first time. first time. First time. For the first time. And I'm thinking to myself, how are we ever going to solve these problems if we can't even go in the same room with each other? And so um, whatever little part the Lubar Center can do to do that, we want to be the ones that facilitate those conversations. Because if you don't have those conversations, as you saw, nothing got done. And so we need to get more done here because there are people who are struggling. There are people who are hurting, people that need us. One conversation that you're going to be having in the coming weeks, and I want to draw attention to this, because it does signal uh, both a, a generational and a racial change in leadership in Milwaukee. Describe for us. Yes, yeah, so we have an event coming up on March 21st, and it's called New Leadership, New Milwaukee. Uh, we have the mayor, uh, Cavalier Johnson. We have the county exec, uh, David Crowley. And we've also invited the Common Council president, uh, 
um, and the county board president as well. And what's so interesting about these four individuals that I'm going to have here at the Lubar Center is that all four of them are people of color. And so for the first time in the 177 year of this city, we have these individuals who are in positions of leadership are for the first time people of color. And what's unique about that as well is that three of those four that I mentioned are also millennials. Yep. So we, for the first time, we have a new, uh, some fresh blood in the house that want to talk about things that are going to affect us all and have a different perspective than the perspective that we've done every single year over and over and over again. So it's going to be a great conversation because they're all dynamic individuals, but they just bring something to the city that we've never seen before, a little youth and leadership and some color. You have a very full life, and I want to spend uh, just a little bit of time talking about the, the many different aspects of your life. So you've got this new uh, job that you're obviously very excited about. Um, but as, as part of who you are, I, I think you're always trying to improve, uh, um, help us improve as people, uh, to make a difference in terms of how people uh, understand themselves. So I, I want to ask you about that. Uh, we just finished Black History Month. Mm -hmm. uh, you uh, are uh, posting a lot of material during Black History Month. Uh, why do you do that? What, what, what specifically are you hoping to accomplish with the uh, social media outreach? Right. Um, so I, I've been using social media for education for a, a, right. a number of things. And Black History is one of them. Another one was I, I tried to convey, when I was a judge, I wanted to convey um, sometimes serious, but sometimes just new changes in the law that none of us are really aware of. And so I would put these posts out, whether it was, you can't use fireworks, or you know, the course closed on Monday, so don't get in trouble because I won't be there till Tuesday, you know, <laughs> things like that. And I would just put those out under the title, Your Friendly Neighborhood Judge, right? Just so that we got this information out. And so I used that for these, the black history posts. And I got on this black history post because I remember my mom actually grew up in Tulsa, Oklahoma, mm -hmm. and um, I remember her telling me about the Tulsa, uh, the Tulsa, the Tulsa uh, race riots, and she told me this story, and I remember talking to a teacher when I was in fifth grade, and I said, um, my mom grew up in Tulsa, and she told me about these Tulsa race riots, and, and I remember my history teacher saying, mm, that didn't happen, and, and, I, and like, I've never heard of it, that never happened, and I remember going home to my mom, and I was saying, mom, that never happened, right? And so after I came to, I woke up, um, <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I, I, I realized that there was so much, you know, that we aren't telling or teaching. And so it was easy to hide it when all the information was in books. But now we have the Internet, and this information is out there available for, for you. And um, so I just, just started going down this rabbit hole of finding information, and now, this is just my 13th year doing it, and now I'm in the process of writing a book and putting all those stories together so that everybody knows those stories. I, I do these posts, I make them small, and I just give you enough information. I don't want to take a lot of your time just to wet your palate, if you will. But I want you to look at it and read it, and I have a lot of people comment to me, and they say, I saw that post. I didn't know that, so I did some research on my own. I'm like, perfect, that's exactly what we're trying to do. Because now we're living in this society where we're... We're having laws passed that say we don't, we can't teach this anymore, um, as if this isn't American history. Um, and so I, I, I just said, if if the if the schools and the states won't teach it, then I'm going to put it out on social media and try to get it out as much as I can, um, because there are absolutely amazing stories about perseverance, about hard work, and about building this country to the way it is today that we have completely completely shut out, and I think it's important that we tell those stories. Another part of uh, Derek Mosley's life, you do a lot of speaking, public speaking, uh, throughout the area, and actually even internationally, about the subject of unconscious bias. Yeah. Um, when did you start doing that, and, uh, and describe for us what, what you talk about when you give these, uh, these remarks? Yeah, so I, I actually got on this kind of, I, I wasn't going out to seek this. I, I teach, as you say, I, right. I, I, I'm a part of the um, Office of Judicial Education, so I teach municipal court judges all across, um, all across the state. And so the National Judicial College invited me out to take part in this training. So I went out to Nevada and took part in the training. And one of the things is to pick a topic. And so I was like, ah, 
I'll do unconscious bias. And so I had to put together a little lecture on it. And that was like the catalyst. And um, I just, it was, it just took over. And then the more I learned about it, so now I, I give that same unconscious bias speech to law enforcement. Uh, everybody who goes through, every police officer in the Milwaukee Police Department that goes through the police academy gets my unconscious bias lecture. Every new freshman, uh, freshman, 1L student here at Marquette Law School gets this unconscious bias lecture. I talk to judges, I talk to um, doctors, I talked to accountants, I did one for the Wisconsin Bankers Association. I mean, all these groups. So basically I tell everybody, if there's anybody, any profession or anything you do where you have contact with another human being, then my lecture is the lecture for you, right? And if you have contact with any other human being and that person is different from you, then my lecture is definitely the one for you, right? And, and that's what we talk about. How would you describe uh, unconscious bias? What's your best description? Yeah, so it's... Um, an unconscious bias is a, a, a preference for or against a person or group of people that happens at a subconscious level. Uh, in fact, we're not even where we have them. And um, the, probably the most important part of the definition is oftentimes uh, our unconscious bias runs contrary to our stated beliefs and attitudes. So you may believe a certain thing, but you have been inundated from the time you were small to the time you are the age you are right now with information that you didn't even know of. Uh, I, I, I tell this, this is the best way to put it. So your brain right now takes in about 11 million bits of information per minute, 11 million bits. But you are only consciously aware of 40 bits of that information. Think about that, 40 bits of that information. So as I'm talking to you right now, you hear these words, that's part of the 40 bits of the information that you are aware of. But while we've been talking here right now, everybody is watching us, your brains are looking at us, wondering what color tie I'm wearing, what kind of tie you're wearing. Wonder why we're so good looking, right? <laughs> Things of that nature, right? So obvious yeah. question. Yeah. <laughs> so your brain, yeah. so your brain is doing all these things that you're not even aware of, and it's and it's having an effect. It gets caught into your subconscious brain, and and on times where we're asked to make decisions about things, we access those reaches of our brain sometimes, and that's what we talk about. It's not that anybody's a bad person or anybody's uh, racist or prejudiced. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with the fact that. You have been bombarded with information your whole entire life, and it's ingrained in us. How receptive are your audiences? Or do you get pushback? Do people say, I'm sorry, I'm not buying that. I don't think I have these biases that, that uh, you know, you might suggest exist. Yeah. Uh, do you get the pushback today? Yeah, so they're, they're, I've given the speech probably 500 times. And there are people, I don't think there's groups Right. But there are people that I speak to that afterwards they come up and they say, well, you know, I, I just treat everybody the same and I don't see color and I'm colorblind. And I'm like, <laughs> right? And, 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 you know, I just say that just because, you know, unless you're legally colorblind, right? Mm -hmm. and, 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 and because, I, you know, I, I'm like, well, I am a different color mm -hmm. than you are. So are you saying you don't see me? I'm right here. And so... I don't want you to be colorblind. I want you to see the different colors. I want you to appreciate and respect all those different. Here's the greatest part about America. Unless you're native or First Nation or indigenous, your people immigrated here or were brought here. That's it. There was no other way you got here, right? And when they came, they brought their culture, their religion, their music, their food. They brought all of that here. And somehow we've kind of lost the appreciation for all of that making us who we are. And so I'm trying to bring that back, that it's an okay that we are different, but that difference makes us better. A couple of other uh, facets to uh, your busy life. Uh, you officiate weddings. How, how many, uh, over a thousand you've done? I've, I've done about almost 1,300. So what, why? What, is it just joy? What, what's yeah, the, yeah. What, well, it's joy. You probably <laughs> enjoy it as much as... I do. I yeah. actually do. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I was only doing a few weddings a year. What, what happened for me is I got sick. So I was uh, diagnosed with uh, end-stage renal disease. And uh, my kidneys were functioning at about 14 13%. And I knew I had to get a transplant. But in the meantime, I was on dialysis. And I was on, my kidneys are so bad, I was on daily dialysis. So I did dialysis every single day for 10 hours a day. And so my, my day was go to work, leave work, go home, 
hook up to the machine, stay on the machine, and then get up in the morning, unhook from the machine, and go to work. That was my process. And so after a while, I did that for two years, every single day, didn't miss a day. And it, it got old. And my, my life got old, right? I, I was missing things. Um, Christmas morning, mm -hmm. right? My kids were up at the crack of dawn, but I'm still hooked up to the machine. And I can't go down and watch them open gifts. So I was missing things. And so you, I needed joy. And where I found joy was in weddings. Because you go to a wedding, everybody's happy. And so for that half an hour, 45 minutes that I'm at the wedding, everybody's happy. And so then I was just chasing that happy. So I was like, one wedding a day, then two weddings a day, then it was six <laughs> weddings a day. And, 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 and I was just chasing that happy. And so that's how it all got started. And it's hard to pull back because it is so much fun. It's a party. And, and you're like the center of it for a little bit, right? And then you get to leave. It's great. It's, it's a blast. So those who know you well uh, know that another joy is found in food. Um, I mean, you are a foodie. When, when did that happen for you? Boy, birth? I don't know. <laughs> I'm not, uh, you know, you know it, um, it actually happened here in Milwaukee, and it happened because when I first moved to Milwaukee, Milwaukee's food scene was very different than it was, than it is today. Um, we were very fortunate here in Milwaukee because we are situated in a very nice place. We're in between Chicago and we're in between Minneapolis. And what's so great about that is every chef in the world wants to make it in Chicago, but every chef in the world can't make it in Chicago. But they're still amazing chefs. And so someone said, hey, let's try Milwaukee. And then one came, and then another came. And then another came. And now we're getting interest from the James Beard Foundation. We have best restaurants and best chefs. And the food scene just it, it exploded. But while it exploded, I don't think we came along with it. And what I say by that is we, and I am guilty of this as well, we're very attached to our routines. And so I meet people that say, I go to Kegels every Friday for fish fry. Or I go to wherever I go for fish fry. Or Saturdays I go here. And so we got into this routine, but now there are all these amazing restaurants. And so for them to make it, you have to patronize them. So I would go to them. I started a food blog under mm -hmm. Milwaukee Food Court. Get it? Food Court? Like Get that. Okay. <laughs> so I so started the, the food blog and my social media and just started to get people to be aware of all these different types of restaurants. And then once you do that and then you have this kind of following, then the restaurants are like, why don't you come on in? Bring your friends, you know? And so, and that's how it, yeah. that's how it just kind of snowballed. So my final question, and I'm, I'm gonna to return to something that Judge Mosley said just a couple minutes ago. Uh, my final question, then we'll take a few questions from the audience. Um, you talked about, um, I guess you could call it a uh, near-death experience, the, the, the transplant you had, the, the kidney failure, which is a remarkable story in, in, to begin with because the transplant donor was someone you My best knew, friend. Your best friend. Yeah, who's also a judge, and we're complete opposites. I mean, yeah. I, I didn't even think that uh, it was going to work. In fact, I, I tell that story all the time. I, I, she's my best friend. I found out. I went to the doctor. They found out that my kidneys weren't working. I picked up the phone. I called her. I said, got bad news. Uh, I need a kidney transplant. My kidneys are failing. And she's like, oh, you can have mine. Like, like I was asking for milk or sugar or I something, know. right? <laughs> and, and, and so I was like, oh, that's so cute. Right? Because, I mean, I mean, we're very different. I mean, I'm male, female, black, white. Uh, I'm the big guy. She's a little woman. And Milwaukee, Waukesha, we're just totally yeah. different people, right? And, and she came back a perfect match. A perfect match. And my, uh, it, it was, so I woke up from the surgery, and uh, the doctor's like, right, when I wake up, he's like, right there. It was kind of frightening, right? You wake up, and you're sitting there, and I'm like, it didn't work, did it? It didn't work. Mm -hmm. And he's like, oh, my God, no, it worked perfectly. Um, and I said, I can't believe it worked. We're so different. And he told me something I'll never forget. He said, I had her kidney in this hand and your kidney in that hand, and I couldn't tell them apart. And it was from that moment right there that changed everything. You, you had uh, another close call uh, with COVID. Yeah. Uh, and uh, maybe you could just share just a little bit about that. But, but then I have one final question I want to ask okay. you related to that. Yeah, um, so being immunosuppressed as a result of having the kidney transplant, my body, my body constantly tries to fight off this kidney because it's a foreign 
um, entity in my body and I take anti-rejection drugs so it doesn't happen, but I'm immunosuppressed. And so March of 2020, you know, people were talking about COVID and my doctor said, hey, just be heads up, there's this thing going around and we, you know, no one really knows what's going on. And so I didn't think much of it. And um, I probably got it from court, they think, because we have court, we interact with people all the time. I'm picking up papers, talking to people and I got COVID. I remember walking up the stairs and I couldn't breathe. I mean, couldn't breathe. And then uh, I got driven, my wife drove me to the hospital. I got to the hospital and my, my blood oxygen level went from like 99 to 95 to 90, to 89, to 80. They're like, we're gonna put you in the ICU. So they put me in the ICU, they closed it all off. And then in 2020, there was no contact with any humans. It was, you were in this room by yourself the whole day. And um, just to tell this part of the story, it just got really, you get really dark. You go to a, a different place. And I remember the doctor came in to, and he said, uh, we don't know what's going on. Um, this is this new virus that's going on. Um, we don't have a treatment because there's no, there no vaccine or anything at that point in 2020. And he said, at this point where you are right now, where your blood oxygen level gets to a certain level, people have done good and, or people have just fallen off. And so you're at that crossroads. And then, you know, and he didn't even come in and tell me that. He called me on the phone because they weren't even coming in the room. Yeah. And so um, I was just dejected. And then a nurse came in with an iPad and it was my wife and my two daughters. And I knew that this was my opportunity to say goodbye because they were going to ventilate me in the morning and the, the ventilation rate, it was like a 90% death rate on the ventilation rate, but they had to ventilate you because you can't breathe. And so I'm talking to them, we're crying, we're laughing, and it just felt good that I was able to tell them I love them and then it was it. So the, uh, the nurse left and then I got to this place where I was at peace, but I was still upset. So I just started crying. And uh, the nurse comes into the room, and no one's touched me in 10 days, right? They don't touch you, physically touch you. And she grabs my hand, and she pulls the chair up to me. I'm getting emotional thinking about it. She pulls the chair up to me, and she says, I'm going to sit here with you all night. We're going to get through this together, and when the sun comes up, we're going to open the shades, and we're going to celebrate one day at a time. And we both started crying, and I woke up in the morning, and she was holding my hand. And from that moment, my blood oxygen started to go up each day to finally got back up to 100, and I was able to leave. But it was that moment you know, that, you know, there's more than just us. There's more than just us here. And so, yeah. How do those experiences change you, and how do they impact what you're doing today? Oh, so, <laughs> is Hillary in here? I don't know if Hillary's in here. Might be here somewhere. Oh, there she is. It, it, so, uh, our program manager at the Lubar Center, could you raise your hand, Hillary? That's Hillary, that's the one you email for the information about our events. Um, and Hillary and I have only known each other for what, like 24 days now, I think? But I, I do everything, I do a lot of things, and I'm moving around, and, I'm, and because this is like life three for me. Right? Yeah. So I look at the kidney transplant as that's one life. I look at the COVID instance, another life. And so obviously someone thinks I have more work to do. So mm -hmm. I use this time all the time. I, I mentioned Hillary because I, I, just, I, I just don't know what she thought when we first met each other. Because I'm like, hey, Hillary, ah, 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 ah. I run it all around. <laughs> but because I, I just feel like I have so much I have to do before it's all done. Gotcha. Right? And gotcha. so. You want to take some questions? Yeah, uh, but can I do something? Because we're, we're passing the torch. I got some questions uh -oh. for you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so real quick. You know, we're be... really short on time. Yeah, I know we are. <laughs> <laughs> so real quick, and this is going to be rapid fire. So oh, I'm just going to okay. give you some choices. You just pick which one you want. All right? <laughs> Deep breath. You ready? All right. Here we go. Water fountain or bubbler? Water fountain. Never, right. never got used to bubbler. Yeah, Grew me up too. on the East Coast. Yeah, oh, me too. Sorry, I'm, I'm out of to Milwaukee. I'm water fountain too. I was, okay. <laughs> Moved here in the sixth grade, but just never, <laughs> never did it for me. Yeah. All right, curds, fresh or fried? Fried. Yep, me too. All right, Olmstead Parks, Washington Park, Riverside Park, or Lake Shore? Lakes, Lake Park. All of the above. All well, right, that's yeah. a great mm -hmm. answer. Cut yeah. them all. All right, uh, championships. Who do you want to see one first? Bucks, Brewers, or Packers? 
<laughs> well, I've seen the Bucks. I've seen the Packers. So I guess it has to be Brewers. There you go. Brewers, you know, there. Yep. They still have to do it. Last one. Happy days or Laverne and Shirley. <laughs> That's it. Can I say neither? But, you know, but uh, <laughs> I just, <laughs> obviously happy days, but, um, but man, that's a, uh, that, don't you feel like that's something that just continues Oh, it just keeps going. Keeps they they going. still, in Orlando, they still play the theme to Laverne and Shirley when the Bucks take the floor. Do and they still yeah, do that? It's like, does anybody at the game even know the theme to Laverne and Shirley? But, but that's what they play. So. I just had to ask you a few questions, but I'm ready to take questions if you want. All right, let's take yep. a few questions. Uh, what we would ask you to do is raise your hand. Um, and uh, do we need a mic or anything for I that? I think everybody or, has a mic at there. Eric, you have it? Okay. Or you have it, Eric? Raise your hand, and we'll, uh, we'll have uh, Derek answer you. Can you come down here, Eric? I'm, I think we're in a... Oh, you can talk from there. Oh, yeah. He's got uh, you right here, there. Here's the deal. Um, I've never adequately explained this in 15 years, but <laughs> since we've been in this building, press down on the black. Yep. Okay, see that? Yep. Press down, and we'll be able to hear your question. Keep green. your finger keep on your finger it. On Just it. keep right on it. I'm curious. Have, have, I love your heritage dinner idea. Have you developed, uh, and, and the notion of getting divided groups together, have you developed a menu that's unique to Democrats and unique to Republicans. <laughs> well, 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 you know what's so great about that? That's a great question. And what's so great about that question is the reason why uh, I love food uh, as far as trying to, to, to bring groups together is that no matter who you are and what you might have different from someone else, the one thing you have in common is you both have to eat. And if you don't eat, you both will die, right? And so it's important that we eat. And so that's how we start that. We're going to have a meal together because we both need it. We have that in common. And then when you start to talk with other people, you realize we have way more in common than that what separates us. So it's important to have those. So thanks. That's a good question. All right. Other questions? Yes, Bill. Can we expect a debate one of these months <laughs> about the pros and cons of teaching critical race theory? Ah, very strong views on both sides of it. Absolutely. Yep. We, well, that just made our list, Hillary. Let's put that down. <laughs> Absolutely. We could do something like that. I, I have. Um, I would be really interested to see if, if someone from the state would be willing to come in to talk about. Yeah. I'm gonna add that to our list. That's good. Idea. Absolutely. Good, good idea. idea. Uh, other questions uh, from folks? Yes, ma'am. It's not a question. Just hold Just it down. Yeah, holding it down. Okay, it's not a question as much as a comment. Uh, the recent programs haven't had a question and answer period, so please continue that. At the Absolutely, end. Okay. and that's part of the the get to knows too as well, because I want it to be an informal environment where you feel comfortable talking to people who affect your life every day. So we're going definitely going to start incorporating more of that. Yes, sir. Um, when you were on sat in your courtroom many times, and I always thought it was one of the most fun things that I ever <laughs> did, because I never saw anybody so funny in my entire life, and the trash talk, basically, between you and whoever was on the other side. Could you talk a little bit about that? Because I've never seen a judge be funny. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it's, um, you know, what you, you make people feel comfortable. Right, and so I'm already sitting up above you already because I sit in that chair, right? And I'm already wearing a robe which differentiates me from everyone else. So I want you to come in, and when you come in, I want you to feel like, man, make no mistake about it, this is your house, right? I don't own this courtroom, this is your house. I sit here, you've elected me to sit here, but this is your house. And so I wanted everybody to feel comfortable when they came in. And you're right, Howard, we had some, we, we laugh, We've cried in that courtroom, but people felt like they were able to be heard, able to have their say, and that's the thing I hear the most. Um, when I left to come here, and they cursed Dean Kearney for <laughs> pulling me away from the bench, and they cursed him for pulling Mary away from the bench, um, but that was the one thing that people always say to me, is that I felt like that I was in a place where I was comfortable, that I was home and I was being heard, and that's all you could ask for as a judge, is make people feel comfortable, and in a place where it isn't all that comfortable. Anybody in the back, if you have a question, we can get a microphone to you, so don't feel like you're, you can't do it because you don't have one of the little black boxes in front of you. Um, right behind Over you. there. I have a very low level question, but I'm curious. Has either of you run a yellow light? 
<laughs> well, of course not. Uh, this is being recorded, right? Yeah, I don't, I don't think your mic's working. I couldn't hear that very well. Uh, not that I recall. <laughs> no comment. I think I probably have, you know, but, but I'm sure it was very early in the yellow part of the process. And so it was a I long would, yellow, right? It would cause oh, no. a greater danger if I stopped, so yes. Yes. This question is for both of you. What gives you hope and what keeps you up at night? <clears throat> but yeah, you, no, no, I've like, been talking to you. You go first. No, no, okay. 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 All right. All right. So um, you're the guest. So what kind uh, of what gives me hope? I, well, I'll tell you what gives me hope. Um, when I walk into this building every day, I get hope because I see these young people that are having conversations about things that affect all of us and about how they're gonna make a difference in the world because they wanna do something about constitutional law. They wanna do something about the environment, environmental law. I hear these conversations and that gives me hope because when you walk into the courthouse, often you don't see a lot of hope, right? You see people who are upset, angry, things of that nature. Here I see people really thinking and studying to make a difference, so that gives me hope. What keeps me up at night is that we're going to continue on this trajectory where we don't talk to each other, where we're going to just silo ourselves so much that we don't um, communicate enough to solve even the most simple problems that we have here. That's what scares me the most. And, and I'll do it exactly the opposite of uh, the judge. I, I, I completely agree with what he said. That's what keeps me up at night. I have serious concerns about how a democracy functions when you have such grave doubts about the pillars of that democracy, the foundations, whether we doubt the free press, whether we doubt the justice system, uh, we don't trust our government officials, we don't trust the outcome of elections. I'm not sure that's a real rosy picture for a democracy going forward. Uh, but having said that, um, I find hope in history because we've had a lot of moments in this country where we, we don't see eye to eye and we uh, um, are not uh, always in the same camp and yet somehow we have found a way so I'm hoping that will be the case again, but, uh, but I'd be less than honest if I, haven't, if I didn't say that I, I do have some pretty serious concerns about where we are right now. Yes, sir, right there. Thank you, this is for, uh, Mr. Mosley. What advice do you have for the individual who will be taking your now vacated seat on the municipal court? Yeah, uh, the, 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 that's a great question. So um, the best advice I could give is that you're in, sitting in a court that's high volume, and I didn't really actually realize this, and I even came from the DA's office, where, which was really high volume, but you have a number of cases, and let's say there's 50 or 100 people that come before you. To you, that's the 100th case you've had, right? But to that person, it's the most important case that you have on your docket. And so what you have to remember the most about is that you have to make people believe that you mean that, right? That when you come and sit down and you talk in the courtroom, that despite the fact that there's a hundred people behind you, what you are saying to me right now is the most important thing going on in this courtroom right now. And that's the best advice I can, I can give. All right. Yes. Yep, just hold it. Yep. Um, I wonder if you would comment on um, the current race for the Wisconsin Supreme Court, and if because of what's, what appears to be going on in the um, paid advertising, et cetera, would you, um, could yeah. you foresee having appointments as opposed to elections? Well, I'm a big fan of elections because I think elections, my problem isn't with the election process for judges. My problem with the election process is that we don't participate in the election process. So I've always... I've run four elections, and those four elections, they're always, judges' elections are always in the spring. And the spring elections are the elections that are the least uh, amount of voter engagement. Many times unopposed. Uh, and, uh, yeah, many times unopposed. And if you are opposed, you know, there's, what, 600,000 people that live in Milwaukee? I don't know how many registered voters they are, but, I mean, I had an election where there was 25,000 people in this entire city. It, it's it's It's... It's sad. Um, in regards to the Supreme Court race that's going on right now, I'm not going to say anything because we're trying to get them here. So I like to get them here to the Lubar Center. So it's a wise man. <laughs> uh, let me go back here. 
Yes. Hang on a second, we'll get you a microphone, okay? Hi. Um, Hi. My question for you is, what are you doing to bring more black and brown voices to the table? My mentor always tells me that the goal is to not to be the only one at the table, but to create space for more people at the table. So what does that look like for you? Yeah. So did everybody hear the question? Mm -hmm. no. All right, so the question was just, what? And I, oh, was just, old, and I don't just mean like, you know, to make sure that our voices are being heard, but to make sure that we have active roles at the table and that people are are seeing under, undermined or underrepresented voices, such as myself, at the trans woman of the experience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so let me tell you this. Um, as I look out into this audience, this was my goal, taking this job, right, is to see a wide range of people here, sitting here in this room today, different cultures, religions, ethnicities, everything you can imagine. So my goal, whether it's outside this door here in the law school trying to retain and attract more, uh, more lawyers of color, whether it is doing that, uh, when, I, when I used to go speak as the judge, I'd always wear my robe. I wore my robe so that when I, so let me, t let me just tell you this. I, am a, I was a judge today, not because someone, my neighbor was a judge or my neighbor was a lawyer or anything like that. I'm a judge today, I became a lawyer because of a TV show. That's the only reason I'm a lawyer today. I, there was a TV show that used to come on called LA Law. Mm -hmm. And LA Law, there was a young attorney played by Blair Underwood, his name was Jonathan Rollins, and he was the first black lawyer I had ever seen. And when I saw him, it made me believe that I could be that person. Now I wanted to be him for all the wrong reasons, right? He had a BMW, he lived on the ocean, all this great stuff, right? But, but that was enough to do that. So what I'm trying to do is just get out and be seen, be me, so that when people see me, they say, well, if he did it, I can do it. Thanks for the question. I think we're going to wrap things up there. I just want to uh, thank everybody for being here. It's so good to see everyone. And, uh, and, I, and again, I just want to say uh, congratulations to, to Judge Mosley. Um, it's, been, uh, it's really been great to, uh, to have you uh, make that big, important decision I appreciate and, and join us over here at the law school. So uh, best of luck, and I know you're going to do great things in the future. And I want to thank you for those 15 years of putting this all together, laying the foundation. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, you. thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you.